Before, I want to start uh, first by thanking Sharon and Jim for uh, having me here. Uh, it's always good to come out and see some of our constituents and I do want to leave some time at the end for questions and feedback um, because I, th I think that hearing from you all is, is a, a good way to understand what we're doing right and things that you'd like to see different. So uh, I'm going to go through my uh, materials as, as quickly as I can and make sure that we've got some, some time left at the end. So I know that I'll, I'll glance over and see where I'm at on the different time. Just quick show of hands, how many of you have participated in a career service case at PERC before? Okay, so that's a, that's, a, that's a fair representation. I've been with PERC since 2012. I've done uh, quite a few career service hearings. The other hearing officers out there have been there uh, a lot longer than I have. So one of the things I did before I prepared this presentation was polled them for some ideas of what they thought uh, a group like you would want to hear as well. So some of the stuff is, is stuff that I've, I've come up with and some of the stuff is stuff that the other hearing officers have come up with. Uh, just so that I'm covering everything. Before I was with PERC, I was an administrative uh, lawyer at an agency, so I kind of know where some of the agencies in, in the room, your, your attorneys have been, and I kind of uh, can gravitate and understand where, where you're at with that. <coughs> the other thing I want to say is that uh, these, I think they said our PowerPoints will be circulated. I've also pr uh, provided some materials to Jim that I think are he's going to circulate. One of, his, one of them is a career service appeals manual that PERC has prepared that kind of goes through in more de detail how uh, the, a career service case proceeds. There's also some flow charts with statutory references and, and procedural rules. And then a couple of articles that uh, have been come out in recent PERC news that deal specifically with certain aspects of career service law that you may or may not be aware of if, if you haven't been following it closely. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about some of those things as we go through. Uh, just briefly, PERC history, we've been around for over 40 years now. We were originally created back in 1974 uh, after a couple of Florida Supreme Court cases uh, said that you need to implement the, the constitutional provisions on uh, collective bargaining for public employees. Uh, so our original jurisdiction was what Jim was talking about, the unfair labor practices, those sorts of things. Through time and, and accretion, we've added a number of other jurisdictions. The one that I'll talk about today is our, uh, was added in 1986, uh, the Career Service Jurisdiction. Before that, the Career Service Commission was the one that heard all these cases. And you'll still see some cases uh, at the DCA level citing to uh, the CSC cases that still are good law and stand for uh, things that we still use today. Subsequent to career services, we had got veterans preference appeals, whistleblower act appeals, uh, drug-free workplace uh, act cases, uh, age discrimination cases. And uh, I think that everyone here knows that in 2001 there were significant changes to our career service ju jurisdiction under the Service First Amendment. I'll talk a little bit about that as well. PERC, is the, as we're currently organized, uh, there are three members of the commission, a chair and two part-time commissioners, all appointed by the governor. Uh, we have a number of hearing officers then that will hear the different kinds of cases, uh, our clerk's office, with a number of employees that, that deal with intake of cases and that sort of thing. Uh, election division that goes around the state or takes mail ballots for when unions have elections. Uh, registrations uh, folks for registering unions and then uh, impasse resolution and mediation uh, folks that uh, deal with our special magistrates for when we have impasses. This I wanted to say a little word about because this is, is, this is brand new. At the beginning of January, we had a almost complete turnover of the commission. Uh, January 5th, Governor Scott appointed Donna Poole as the chair of the commission. Probably some of you are familiar with her from her time. She was previously, immediately previous to this, a part-time commissioner, but she's got a lot of experience with PERC. She was a former uh, chair of PERC, and so she's moving from a commissioner slot into the chair slot. The other uh, commissioners are uh, Kurt Kaiser, 
prior to this, he was a uh, general counsel at PSC, and he was a member of the legislature, uh, both in the House and Senate, and has a lot of experience in, in state government. And then Jim Bax uh, is the third and the part-time commissioner. He also has a, a lot of experience in state government over the years. He's been the head of a, a number of different agencies as well. So we're looking forward to, to, to getting them all up to speed and, and, and seeing how they uh, change the commission or what, what their uh, focus is going to be on. Some of this is uh, things that Jim touched on briefly. I'm going to go through in a little bit more detail. I want to start by talking about some of the statutes and rules that we deal with most often, and then I want to go into some of our case law. Not only the case law itself, but how you find PERC precedent, because it's changed recently and it's not always been intuitive, even for us as hearing officers, how you find uh, decisions that are on point or uh, resources that you can use to uh, determine how your case is going to proceed. Uh, this is the pr provision Jim put up, 110.227, talks about uh, career service employees and the uh, um, types of cause that you can have poor performance, negligence, inefficiency, or inability to perform assigned duties. Insubordination, violation of the provision of laws or agency rules, conduct unbecoming a public employee, misconduct, habitual drug abuse, or conviction of any crime. Those are mirrored, of course, in the DMS rules that I'll, I'll throw up here in a second. But uh, the DMS rules kind of give more gloss on, on those provisions, and we look at those pretty closely when we're uh, deciding our cases. Uh, section 5A, this is, talks about uh, a, someone who's attained their career service satisfactorily, can't be uh, suspended, have, be demoted, have a reduction in pay, involuntary transfer more than 50 miles by highway, or dismissal without receiving written notice uh, at least 10 days prior to that. There is an exception to that that I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later for extraordinary dismissals. Uh, I didn't put a slide in here on Chapter 447, uh, Part 2, but all of our jurisdiction flows from that as well. So the provision that talks about career service cases in 447 cross-references 110.227, but that's where you can find some of our procedures as well. The other ones that we deal with most often as hearing officers, of course, are the Administrative Procedures Act, Chapter 120, Florida Statutes, that go governs uh, hearings with disputes of material fact. I think j just pretty much any career service case that makes it to our level, there's, it's not often something that's decided on a law where you don't have material facts in dispute. It's, it's always a, a, a part of 120.57.1 hearing. So we'll look to that. Um, Florida Administrative Code rule, that's the DMS disciplinary rule. And then the uniform rules of procedure, we deal with that quite a bit uh, in, a, in our hearings. Previously, PERC had a whole body of its own procedures, but as those uniform rules were adopted, we pretty much have adopted those whole cloth, particularly in the career service cases. So you'll see those quite a bit, and those govern how the hearing will proceed. Other agency rules and procedures, I think that uh, most of y'all are operating under DMS disciplinary rules. There's a few agencies out there that, that still use some of their own disciplinary rules like Department of Corrections uh, and there's a few others. The one thing that I'll, I'll say about this is a lot of times when we have a, a cause case where there's a violation of an agency rule or procedure, uh, those will come into evidence through us and we'll take administrative notice, but it's always something to be thinking about. If you're relying on one of your own rules uh, as a basis for discipline under the DMS rules, that we need to know about that and, and, and see it. Here, I didn't throw up all this because it would have been uh, slide after slide of text, but it's, this mirrors the statute. Uh, where we see our most cases, I think, are poor performance, negligence, occasionally, uh, inefficiency, uh, insubordination occasionally, but I'd say the most are poor performance, violation of law or agency rules. 
conduct and becoming a public employee is kind of a catch-all provision that, that um, a lot of times we'll see cited. Habitual drug use, most often those cases end up being drug place, uh, uh, workplace act cases. So uh, when those get filed at, the, at PERC, the clerk will often set those up as a career service slash drug force workplace act case and then we'll issue an order having the agency uh, designate which uh, statute and act they're proceeding under. Turning to, to case law and where to find commission precedent, I'll go through each of these in a little bit more detail, but uh, starting with our PERC website, you can find a lot of information there on the cases that deal with career service. Uh, PERC newsletters that come out quarterly, uh, PERC publications, the representation and career service appeals uh, document that I referred to at the beginning of the presentation, that's something that will be distributed to you electronically. Uh, appellate decisions and career service cases can also be found at our website. That's a document that, that synopsizes those. And then the uh, Florida Career Service Reporter, some of the, you probably are familiar with those red binders in your office. That's changed uh, significantly recently, so I'll get into that a little bit too. And then the DOA website for Florida agency indexed orders. Uh, historically, all of our decisions have either appeared in the FCSR or FPER. Um, the thing about the FCSRs that was troubling to me when I started at PERC was that they are not electronically searchable. They're all in paper, so it's kind of hard to research those, especially considering it was in 2012 when I started. I thought that everything was available electronically. So that's something that we've been working on for a number of years to, to, to make those more available. And uh, so we aren't, aren't using the red binders as much anymore, particularly with the House bill from last year that requires all uh, index, indexing of all of the agency's orders at DOA. Everything from July 1st of last year forward is now on uh, DOA's website and searchable there. And I'll show you a little bit more about how to get to that here in a second. Resources at our website, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about these just so you know where to find it. Uh, first of all, our, our website is a, a little bit web 1.0. I don't know where we're at on website design now. I think that hopefully if I come next year, I'll be talking about our Facebook account and our Twitter account and we'll have a totally revamped website. But right now, the, I'm still trying to find these people at the top of the screen. I've never met them, but apparently they work, <laughs> work at Perk somewhere. Um, but as, aside from the, the, the appearance, there's some good information there, and I think that that'll continue to be the case as we go forward. You can get to uh, our hearing schedules there on the, on the right-hand side, uh, orders and, uh, and appeals if you know case numbers, uh, registration and certifications of unions are all available th through our website. So the publications I referred to earlier you can get to here on the left, and that includes the uh, document on representation and career service appeals, uh, a scope of bargaining argument uh, uh, document that has uh, information on that if you're interested. The two final documents there, appellate decisions in career service cases and appellate decisions in labor cases, haven't been updated in a while. And I think that that's one of the things that we'll be looking at updating in the, in the future. However, I will say that the career service uh, case one is organized by uh, subject matter. So even though it hasn't been updated by 2012 and doesn't cover some of the more recent cases in career service, it does give you an idea of the types of issues that you can see in a career service case and you can go to it and, and look through it by subject and say, oh, well, here's a case that dealt with poor performance that made it to the DCA level and has a decision on it, and then go from there to research whether or not that's still good law. 
Uh, Perk newsletter. How many of y'all already subscribed to the Perk News? Okay, that, that's something that I'd, I would recommend if this is an area that you deal with at all and or have a passing interest in. You can go to our website and sign up with your email address to receive those automatically when they come out. And uh, there's a lot of any sort of update in the law or uh, synopsis of cases end up being in that newsletter. Uh, articles on on big th big changes will always be in there. So, and the other thing that I'd say about it is, one way that that you can research our decisions is if you go through the Perk News and go to the section that's that talks about career service cases. You can get, read through past issues and find a case that looks like it ha might be similar to your case or have issues that are similar to your case. And from that Perk News, you can click on the hyperlink there, and that'll take you directly to the hearing officer's order and the final order and give you an idea of how that the hearing officer ended up deciding the case and how the commission addressed any of the hearing officer's findings in the case. This is Doe's website, of course. I imagine all of you have started indexing your orders as well. Uh, the nice thing about this is that, as I was saying before, the FCSRs, you couldn't search by text. Uh, now you can go into DOE's website and designate PERC as the agency you want to search within. You can even designate that you want to search career service cases and then it has a simple text search. It's not quite as robust as Westlaw and Lexis in terms of, of the searchability, but it does uh, give you the ability to search key terms and, and some of orders, at least through decisions that have come out since July 1st of last year. Um, I'm not sure if we'll end up putting some of our old decisions uh, prior to that in the database yet. That's something that, that, that we may do, um, but uh, still needs to be resolved. Also, I'm thinking, and maybe someone in the room already knows this, but that Westlaw and Lexis, if they haven't already, will start picking up this database now that everything's combined, and that'll give you a a better ability to search that. I know that that's something that I've been wanting to follow up with with the administrative law section of the Florida Bar because they were behind that uh, statute dealing with uh, the uh, having everything collected in, at Doe's website. That's just the where you go to, to do the search. I don't think that uh, it'll let you search by your agency and PERC. I think you have to delineate, but certainly you could put in your agency into the text search box and then limit it to PERC to find decisions that apply exclusively to your agency. Uh, one thing also I'll say is that if you're filing documents with us, pre-hearing documents or post-hearing documents where you're citing our precedent, we're no longer using FCS, CSR. Uh, citations, one of the things that's going to be distributed to you electronically is a, a little article on the new citation format so that we know where you're looking to find it and it'll actually cite to you the DOA order number and the date of the, of the decision uh, for the citation format. Talk a little bit about who's, who's covered, I think that uh, Jim talked about this a little bit. Uh, career service employees, that's folks that have one year of service in. That means local government people aren't covered. Uh, probationary people aren't covered. Uh, SES, senior management, OPS aren't covered. Some of them may have some of the other rights Jim was talking about uh, where they may even end up in front of the PERC, but those folks aren't, aren't, aren't able to file a career service appeal. Uh, probationary employees, I, I, won't, I won't just want to touch on that briefly. That's, that's an issue that can be uh, where you do need to get down in the weeds, particularly if you have someone who's been in state government before and then switches jobs uh, or is, is moving from position to position. The, whether or not they qualify career service will depend uh, basically on how, how that's happened.
Uh, the actions that can be appealed, again, this is straight out of the statute, dismissals, demotions, suspensions, reductions in pay, involuntary transfers of more than 50 miles by highway. Most of those are considered disciplinary actions where you're taking discipline. However, I will say that there are situations where non-disciplinary actions will end up in front of PERC. I mean, if you think about it, most often a transfer is for some reason other than a disciplinary action. It's to make sure that you've got coverage somewhere or you're moving, shifting employees around. So those can be non-disciplinary actions, uh, inability to perform, that's someone gets injured or something like that and can no longer perform their job duties. That's not necessarily considered a disciplinary action, but it's still something that they can appeal to, to PERC. Choice of forum, I'll skip over that because I think Jim covered that. I will just say that once you've selected one of those, you lose the other two options. So uh, occasionally we'll see that issue where someone has a pending grievance and they're trying to file a career service uh, appeal. What you do in those situations quite often is file a motion to dismiss and, and let the hearing officer or the commission know, hey, this person's got a, this other action pending and has uh, already made their choice. And then the choice of uh, Drug-Free Workplace Act and Career Service Appeal. I talked a little bit about that already. Uh, one thing that I, I, I will say, too, is the types of things that aren't covered. Layoffs, situations where there's been our massive changes in the agency, those types of things uh, aren't appealable to PERC. Initiation of the action, Jim talked a little bit about this too. Usually a written predetermination notice is given to the employee at least 10 days before the action. Uh, here I'll talk a little bit about the extraordinary circumstances. You don't have to give the employee 10 days notice uh, if retaining the employee would result in damage to state property, be detrimental to the best interest of the state, would result in injury to the employee, a fellow employee, or some other people per person. So those are I mean, your serious issues, your HR things where you have to take some sort of emergency action, you can do that without uh, going through the process of the 10-day notice. Just keep in mind that that's a question that could be litigated before us at PERC, and we'll see that from on occasion where someone said, hey, there, there was no reason for this extraordinary dismissal, so just make sure you have your ducks in a row if you're going to take extraordinary action. And then, of course, the opportunity to appear in front of the uh, agency prior to the final action being taken. So a lot of times these, these predetermination uh, decisions, documents associated with them will come into a PERC hearing or the agency will try to introduce those in one form or fashion. And quite often those, there, there can be relevant information in that. However, I will say that since all PERC proceedings are de novo, uh, a lot of times the, how you got to that decision won't matter as much as, as the reasons behind the decision. So um, occasionally you'll have a hearing officer that doesn't want to hear much about, well, how did you, I get here? They're more interested in the merits of, of why the decision was made rather than the process. Uh, the next step is final action letter is issued the, to the employee. It has to contain the notice of rights that uh, indicates that they have an appellate right to PERC. Um, one of the, the things that's going to be circulated is kind of some model language for what that notice should look like. We have, a, uh, I think, less now, but we had a situation f a few years back where we were getting a lot of late appeals and folks that were unclear as to the process, and we started looking at agency notices and, and kind of developed a a model. Some agencies will attach the career service appeal form to the actual final action letter. That's not required, but it's something you can consider. And then that the time frame for appeal, 21 dates from the receipt of the letter. Uh, a lot of agencies will hand deliver those so that they have uh, a good date or send it by certified mail so they have a good date to, to say this is when the clock starts ticking for that 21 days. And then the appeal from the employee has to be received by the uh, commission within that 21 days. So if they've dropped it in the mail and it gets to us even a day late, that's something where 
uh, you all can file either a motion to dismiss for late filed appeal or sometimes even if it's something we'll notice in the clerk's office, we'll do an order to show cause why it shouldn't be dismissed to, to be for being late. What to include in a final action letter, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about this because when I polled the other hearing officers on what they wanted me to, to impart to y'all, that was the thing that came up most often. Uh, there's a, we see a wide variety of final action letters. Um, some are very good, some are, are the, the quality could be improved. However, uh, just keep in mind that that's the first impression that the hearing officer is going to have of your case. We read those things very closely. Uh, we're going to limit what the issues are at, at hearing based on what's in that disciplinary, that final action letter. Um, so it's, it's good to, to spend some time on the front end and make sure that it reads cleanly and, and makes sense and, and has all, those, all the things it needs in it. Uh, one thing that I'd tell you is have some precision in the, the rule violations that you're alleging. Sometimes we'll see final action letters where it's kind of a laundry list of all the things in the DMS rule, and then we're, we're at hearing sorting out, okay, well, which one of these are, are you actually proceeding under? It's just easier on the front end to, to limit it to the exact uh, rule violations that you're using. And then also, uh, make sure that you include a, a factual basis that, that, uh, for, the, for the action that uh, is robust enough so that the hearing officer kind of gets an idea of what's going on. Due process wise, you need to have the employee on notice of what they're being disciplined for, obviously, but it helps too if the, if the hearing officer can read the final action letter and quickly get an idea of uh, what the issues in the case are going to be. One thing that occasionally we'll see, and I don't know how, how many agencies do this, but they'll f issue a final action letter that, that just refers back to the predetermination letter. I'd, I'd advise you to go ahead and, and put this information in the final action letter so that we aren't digging through to find the predetermination letter and, and compare it uh, to one another to make sure everything's in there. And also, I think I mentioned that up front when I started talking about this, but we're going to limit what the hearing's about to what's in the final action letter. However, I, I, there's a fine line between including too little and, and too much. If we'll get some voluminous final action letters from time to time that have multiple exhibits, multiple p pages. Sometimes that may be necessary if you've got a, a complex performance case that has a lot of things that, that may be something that you can't get away from. But if you can do it sh uh, succinctly in, in, in a shorter letter, that often that's more effective. E-filing with PERC, I'll, I'll just say a, a little word about this. I'm not the tech person or the e-file guy, but our clerk's office is very uh, helpful. You can call about e-filing mm -hmm. and they'll step you through the process. We do have some documentation on how to e-file with us and uh, it gets us, gets us the documents that much quicker have to be in PDF, PDF format. Uh, large documents should be divided into parts. Let me make at least a, one plug for uh, on April 1st, the Labor and Employment Law section is going to be putting on a uh, CLE here in town with a number of different agencies and PERC's participating in that. And our panel is going to have uh, some folks from the clerk's office, some hearing officers, some commissioners. So just uh, be on the lookout for, for that because I think that one of the things that the clerk is going to cover is some of the nuts and bolts of how you go about filing different things with us. Uh, the labor and employment law section should should distribute it, but I'll make sure that I I think that we're going to see the announcement here with a few. I'll send it to Jim to you so that he's got it as well. And then let I think it's going to be designed for new attorneys that are just. Uh, starting to, to practice, so if you have attorneys in your office that you haven't, don't have a lot of experience with PERC on, and some of the other agencies uh, like DOA and FCHR, it might be something to send them to as well. I think Cheyenne, who's speaking later days, is, is going to be presenting at that as well. 
the other thing I wanted to stress while I'm on this slide, I don't ha have the actual court rule up there, but uh, you know that the, the court rules have now limited what you should be uh, filing with courts in terms of confidential information. Uh, I, would, uh, I would urge you, when you're looking at your documents that you're going to file into evidence to go through and redact things that don't need to be in there. Sometimes we'll have agencies introduce a whole personnel file as, a, as an exhibit and then we're stuck going through and, and redacting social security numbers and often it's not, that you don't need the whole personnel file, you just need limits, limited documents from it. So be aware of that when you're introducing things. If you do have some confidential documents that you need to file with us, there's, there's definitely mechanisms for, for doing that, but put us on notice when you file that with a motion of some sort to say, hey, we want this sealed, and often the clerk then will say, okay, well, this is something that we can't release under a public records uh, act, and uh, it always helps to mention that not only in a motion, but then at the hearing as well to say, hey, just be aware that this is something that's confidential. A lot of times we'll see that with uh, law enforcement addresses and um, DOC plans of the way that the prisons are laid out. All those things are exempt from 119. How am I doing on time? Okay. Uh, the pre-hearing process starts, the hearing officer is assigned by the commission and then we pretty much immediately will file our notice of hearing and pre-hearing order. That contains another number of important deadlines in it and information about how the case is going to proceed. Uh, notably whether or not it's going to be a telephone or on-site hearing. It'll give you your timeline for filing pre-hearing statement and filing your ex exhibits. Uh, the predetermination notice and notice of final action and written appeal are automatically in the record. Uh, everything else has to be introduced at hearing through uh, uh, exhibits. It also, that order lays out that sound recordings must be transcribed and delivered to the other side at least three days before the hearing. So if you have something where you're going to rely on a taped conversation with an employee or something from an investigation, uh, keep, keep in mind that that'll have to be transcribed. I did want to say uh, briefly about telephone versus on-site hearings. I think most of you all know that a lot of our things are by telephone and sometimes that works because the agency's uh, folks are here in Tallahassee. However, if you have something where it's a complex case with a lot of witnesses or lots of exhibits and that needs to be on site, we'll default to that and uh, if you know more about the case up front than we do, if you feel that's a case where it's going to be, be a benefit to have it on site with everyone there, go ahead and file a motion and those will be pretty routinely granted if it's something that uh, would be better to have an on site hearing. The hearing, these are fast track cases, unlike some of our other cases, they're set within 30 days of the appeal being uh, filed uh, unless the parties agree to set it later. Uh, a lot of times, People aren't ready to go to hearing in 30 days, so they'll agree to a, a short continuance. Um, if, if that's something that you're interested in, you can always contact the other side and, and talk to the clerk's office about when to set, when to set the hearing. Uh, motions that, that are filed during the, the pre-hearing process. The only thing I'd say about that is that make sure that you're looking at your uniform rules and a lot of times we'll have motions coming in, most, not often from agencies, most often from folks that are representing employees that aren't familiar with our pra practices, but they won't have consulted with you and, and uh, said, stated your position on the motion. Those are pretty uh, routinely denied because that's one of the requirements in the uniform rules that you've consulted with the other side. And a lot of times when you've done that, uh, it may be that you can work out the issue and don't even need to file a motion. This is our career service cases. There's no discovery usually under, unless there's extraordinary circumstances. The rationale behind that is that I think that from the predetermination conference and, and everything 
most people are familiar with the facts and evidence. They don't need a lot of discovery. Uh, you probably get some 119 requests for certain documents before the hearing that, that uh, end up serving as a quasi-discovery, but if you do need discovery, there's a mechanism for that in the statute and you can ask for it, but most often in career service cases, that's not something that we see a lot of. Pre-hearing statements, those are due usually uh, uh, shortly before the hearing. Yet in those, you have to identify all the witnesses that are going to be called, except for your rebuttal witnesses, and then make a brief statement about any facts that each witness is going to testify about. Uh, also, it helps to put if there's any issues or pre-hearing motions or that, that sort of thing in your pre-hearing motion. That'll put the hearing officer on notice that that's something that needs to be considered at the hearing. Pre-filed exhibits for your telephone hearings, uh, make sure that you've delivered those to the other side. And if we're in different hearing locations on a telephone hearing, make sure that everyone who's going to be appearing has a copy of the relevant exhibits they're going to need to testify about. Uh, sometimes witnesses aren't available and we'll get motions ahead of time that they want to testify from telephone from a third location. Uh, those can, are pretty routinely granted as well. But uh, you just need to make sure that if you're going to question the witness about a particular document that they have a copy of it in front of them. Continuances, settlements, and stays. There's language in 110T27 that disfavors continuances in these cases. Um, it, it says that if, unless all the parties agree, there can't be a continuance. Sometimes that runs up against the due process and, and there needs to be a continuance. Uh, stays, if Jim talked a little bit about criminal proceedings, we'll see that a lot in criminal proceedings where someone is, is being dismissed for something they've done that's also in tandem uh, resulted in criminal charges. Sometimes prosecutors don't want you to front run them on, on the criminal charges because the stuff that happens in our hearings can be brought up in the criminal proceedings. So uh, the employees will want to stay that and see how, what the outcome of the criminal case is. And you can file a stay, a motion to stay the case uh, for that. Settlements, just taking off my hearing officer hat and putting on my old agency hat. If, it's helpful if, if you've at least thought about what terms you might be willing to settle about early on and communicated with the other side. Our, our clerk's offices will facilitate some of that. But uh, also, who has the authority to settle and the, and the terms are important. A lot of times we'll get to, to hearing and uh, it'll be the first time that anything like that's been discussed. Probably all of you have wrote uh, settlement agreements that you use with employees that um, contain language along the lines of that they'll dismiss their career service appeal and, and waive exceptions and, and things like that. But uh, that's one of the things that if you don't have those documents, you can research those through our website and see what's been filed in some of the cases where things have settled ahead of time. Hearings, pretty much all the hearing officers have some version of this pre-hearing conference, so it's good to have thought about these issues before you get to hearing. Uh, witnesses, whether or not you want to sequester them, um, usually agencies, if it's a bunch of agency witnesses, they don't invoke the rule of sequestration, but it, it's more often the employee or the attorney that on the other side that wants to sequester. So be thinking of who your agency rep is going to be uh, that person doesn't have to be sequestered, even if they're a witness and can stay in through the entire hearing. Also, uh, notaries have to be present to, to swear in any witnesses over the phone. That's something that we'll routinely ask at the, during the pre-hearing conference if the parties are willing to waive that. Uh, exhibits, if you've given some consideration to whether or not you have any strong objections to the exhibits on the other side. Uh, We'll ask if anything can be stipulated up front to short, as a shortcut to the hearing so that we don't have to have testimony on something that's going to come into evidence. Stipulations, we usually have a few, but if you've 
if, if it's something where there's a large amount of agreement as to what actually happened between uh, you and the employee, uh, feel free to work out some stipulations on things that don't need to be litigated and bring those up to the hearing officer at the beginning of the hearing so that they can take those into consideration. Uh, admissions, usually all the hearing officers will do this. They'll take a copy of that final action letter and go through the factual basis in the letter and ask which portions of it the employee admits to. So that's another reason to have a, a 20. 10. 10, okay, I'll, let me speed up a little bit. <laughs> that, uh, that's another reason to have a good final action letter. Um, administrative notice, uh, rules, statutes, quite frankly, a lot of times I like having those as exhibits and I think the other hearing officers like having those as exhibits as well. That way that if there's a question about what, what statute or rule was in place at the time or if it's an agency rule, then we'll have that in here uh, as an uh, exhibit. Uh, Pre-hearing motions and then Usually, uh, if there's any interest in settlement, sometimes when you get all the parties in the same room for the first time, uh, we'll step out and give Barry a chance to talk to y'all. Burden of proof, agency has to prove uh, by preponderance of the evidence that there was just cause for the action taken. Uh, the agency puts on its case for cause, then the employee will put on its defense case, including mitigation if applicable. Uh, and then rebuttal by the agency. There's, I know there's some things I definitely want to cover, so let me. I think you all are familiar with the use of hearsay in perk hearings, and um, that it can come into to our hearings. It just can't be used as the sole basis for a finding of fact. So it can supplement other other facts that you've proven. So we will occasionally get into hearsay issues in our hearings. Court reporter versus commission recording. I think that uh, years ago the court, the commission had all of its hearings with court reporters and the agencies will still occasionally use court reporters. I think that more and more folks are relying on our recordings and then if there needs to be a transcript, they'll make it from that recording and it works pretty well. Uh, mitigation, most employees is, of course aren't entitled to, to mitigation, it's, it's delineated in statute who is entitled to it. Law enforcement, correctional officers, firefighters and professional health care providers. Uh, law enforcement, correctional officers and firefighters are relatively straightforward. We'll occasionally get into things with uh, whether or not someone meets the definition of a professional health care provider when we're talking about different kinds of nurses and things like that. And then the burdens on the employee to uh, prove mitigation. Before Service First, there were statutory mitigation requirements, but uh, that Service First eliminated that statute. However, the Commission case law says that we'll still rely on those statutory criteria, which are the seriousness of the conduct as it relates to employees' duties, action taken with respect to other similar employees, uh, previous employment or disciplinary record, and then in extraordinary circumstances beyond the employee's control. Post-hearing filings, uh, again, this is a truncated uh, thing. You usually do, do seven days after hearing. I'll occasionally give folks a few days extension, but my, hearing, my orders do out 15 days from the day we have the hearing under no, uh, and, and there's no exceptions to that. So. Uh, you got to have those things in pretty quick. You will have an election at the end of the hearing whether or not you want to do an oral closing statement or a, a written statement. I think I speak for all the hearing officers where we like the written statements better because it gives us something to, to go back to our offices and ponder. Uh, when to order a transcript. I think that most folks now are not ordering transcripts unless there's something in the, that they want to challenge at the commission level. That's a decision that uh, if you have to have your things in within seven days, uh, you're talking about an expedited transcript. And usually I think most agencies at this point are deciding whether or not that to order a transcript at the, after they've seen what the uh, hearing officer recommends. Again, I'll give you a chance to read this one in the uh, electronic format.
This is just the standard that the commission will use in judging findings of fact and reviewing our hearings. Uh, that's also mirrored in the statute. Reopening the record, uh, this will be something you can read through later. That's, the commission is very reluctant to reopen the record, so if you have something that you're surprised at hearing or you, uh, or you need to have something, the better course is maybe to make a motion to keep the record open to give you a chance to submit something later uh, or, have an, or ask for a continuance so you can have another day of hearing rather than let the record get closed because it's hard to reopen the record once it's been closed. The commission will issue an order within 45 days of the hearing um, or the filing of exceptions and then the upholding the agency action will result in dismissing the appeal. If there's no cause for the action or the action was too severe, the commission will usually enter a non-final order vacating the agency's action. That's based on the Schwartz case that you can uh, go and read. Uh, that can lead to some strange results in terms of if it's something that, that's been dismissed and we've the commission orders them to be reinstated. You can't appeal that decision until they've been reinstated and uh, they issue a final order resolving back pay and some of the other issues. Remedies, reinstatement, uh, vacating suspensions, mitigation to a lesser penalty, uh, back pay, I wanna talk a little bit about that. Uh, civil actions to enforce the commission's order. Uh, attorney's fees, I think everyone knows that Service First got rid of attorney's fees. There is a case that I'll have you all keep your eyes on though. Uh, it's at the first DCA right now. The case number is 1D154819 Johnson versus DOC. What happened in that case was that the parties filed a motion under 12595. The commission actually made a decision to refer that over to DOA. Uh, DOA said that on 12595 there wasn't a basis for fees, but that's up on appeal now. And the hearing, uh, the ALJ and that made some statements about situations where there might be a ch uh, potential for attorney's fees. So I urge you all to keep an eye on that case. Uh, 1D154819 Johnson versus DOC. This, there's going to be an article in your materials that details uh, these changes. The commission recently overhauled back pay proceedings pretty significantly. This is a, a summary of, of those changes from a case that came out after Vickery and Harrell. Um, employees not required to seek comparable work in order to be entitled to back pay. What had happened was that uh, we were denying back pay to folks that weren't looking for jobs in their same class. They said, oh, that's not a, a requirement anymore. You can look for any type of work, and that's going to be something that we'll consider in whether or not someone's entitled to back pay. Uh, unemployment compensation benefits, if someone's received those, that can be evidence of a good faith job search. Uh, once someone uh, obtains employment, they're entitled uh, to back pay um, and don't have to continue looking for another job. Additionally, the commission uh, said pr previously that the employees had to come in with documentation showing evidence of their good faith job search. Uh, the commission eliminated that and said the hearing officer, that's within the purview of the hearing officers. If uh, someone comes in and testifies uh, credibly to their job search, we, you can rely solely on that. Certainly someone who comes in with testimony plus documents is going to be more credible, but let me go ahead. And I, want, I do want to have time for questions. Uh, once the final order is issued then, uh, it's appealed to the uh, DCA within 30 days. Again, you have to wait for that final order to be issued. So if it's something where we've, the commission has vacated a disciplinary action, you have to wait for that second subsequent order. Um, with that, how am I on time? Am I out of time? Okay, well, with, with that, I can, I can circle back and talk about some of these other things, but I do really want to hear some questions and thoughts and, and things from you all if you have any.